In today's episode, I have the pleasure of being joined by racing expert Andy Holden, who many of you will perhaps be most familiar with thanks to his long-running odds checker racing column and his work on William Hill Radio. Yet prior to your work with both of them, Andy, you had quite a grounding in the betting world, working in betting shops, becoming a professional punter from the age of 30. So do you want to kick things off with a bit of an introduction to you, your time in the betting world and all the various things you've done up to this point? Yeah, hi, Peter. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on in the first place. Uh, Very grateful of that. And hopefully I can give you some kind of insight to what I do and how I got here in the first place. I mean, it all goes back to sort of my childhood, really, and and my love for racing. My dad was sort of like the biggest influence in in two ways. He obviously introduced me to racing in the first place, took me to Cheltenham Festival in the halcyon days of like Mungsfield, Sea Pigeon, Bird's Nest in the 70s. So I was born up in the, the golden age of champion hurdlers and I, I just sort of fell in love with the sport the excitement of it not necessarily the betting side I hadn't really got much of an interest then I used to go along with my dad and you know, he sort of like just got me to appreciate it for what it is and, and particularly Cheltenham as well so I, I very much got the love of the horse and the thrill and the adrenaline of it in the first place so that was in my blood from a very early age so much so that I used to run home from school uh, as a young boy uh, with my sort of backpack on my bag and run home to get the last two races on BC when they used to be hosted by Julian Wilson and Peter O'Sullivan back in the 70s. So I knew from an early age, like I say, racing was going to be part of my life in some way, shape or form. And then everything has evolved from there, really. When I left school, got a job, as I say, as a humble betting shop manager, did my sort of apprenticeship work, the hard yards for many years. And then I got to sort of like late 20s when I felt as though I was maybe good enough having watched so many races to perhaps have a crack at being a punter. So it was just a matter of biting the bullet, taking the plunge, going without a safety net, getting a bit of a float and having a bit of a crack. But it was at that same time when I met, who was my sort of second biggest influence, was Steve Goff, who's a well-known punter in the sort of Midlands area, and his colleague, Peter Jones. They were just basically way, way ahead of their time. They were doing things back then in the 80s, 90s that we're doing now. And obviously they made hay while the sun shone taking advantage of all their expertise and the timings and the speed figures that they used to create. And being an inquisitive young lad, I kind of like wanted to sort of follow in their footsteps. So Steve took me on his wing, took me racing, showed me a few things that he did. And from there, I basically went on my own. I read a few manuals and a few horse racing books, basically on time. Andy Bay's speed figures, Nick Morden on time, his book which at the time cost around about a ten. It's probably the best ten pound I ever spent. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Yeah, he gets referenced a lot. Yeah, that spawned my fascination with times and thinking, if I could do these myself, this could work. Because with my own eye, my own sort of like judgment, which was fairly reasonable, I thought at the time, nowhere near perhaps the level now, um, but it was certainly good enough that I thought I could do okay. And myself and and Sam and Andy were obviously good friends at, at the time and they had a keen interest in racing. I started to sort of write the formulas down because back in the old day, you couldn't, we didn't have the sort of data programs and stuff we have now. That's all come alongside with it. So I used to sort of like my calculations based on Nick's formulas. And I noticed they start to work, particularly with Irish racing as well. Not many people looking at Irish racing. I remember back in Hardy Eustace, based on the time figures that I got way back in the early noughties and horses like that. I think, God, this, this is re- really something. And then everything's just progressed from there, really. Like I say, to, to get from where I started from to now has is, is been a long road, and perhaps we could fill in the blanks along the way. But that's generally the crux of it, how I started, and you know, that, that's how I got into it in the first place. And so it's, I'm trying to, you know, without trying to age, get your work out your age, you probably started at the right time, you know, with the internet explosion of betting, and yes. perhaps where we don't have the, some of the issues we get now, but we, don't, we didn't have affordability limits. But even restrictions were not quite as hard. So it was obviously a good time to to bet. How was that, though, at that period, at age 30, when you started to professionally bet? Did you, I presume you made it quite successful? Yeah, I sort of feel very grateful of taking the plunge when I did, really, because at the time, you could get on pretty much what you wanted with most firms. Betfair back in the day when it was, the liquidity was really good. It, it just suited me. And I, I used to do quite a lot of in-running stuff as well and a good sort of like connection I felt as though I was probably one of a minority that had a reasonable amount of knowledge, plus the numbers that I got. And I, I studied races, watched the, how horses finished their races off, 
I thought I could read a race really well, watch track positions. I, I was on to things really, really quickly. So like I say, I made quite a bit of reasonable money in a probably about a five-year period, enough to sort of set me up and to relax a little bit and to sort of fall back on if I ever had a fallow period. And yeah, well, like I say, everything's led from that really, from starting off as being a reasonably decent, successful punter to getting asked to go on William Hill Radio, thanks to my friend Sam Turner, who used to work for CFAX, as it was at the time, William Hill. Obviously, they used to have the racing service and they had the radio station and he got me on that. I've been on that ever since. And then from that, again, I've just been very lucky. I've fallen into the, the odd checker stuff because people recognised I was a reasonably decent judge and they you know, wanted me to write a column on there and, and do some tipping and stuff like that. So because I've, I've just been very lucky. I've, I've just been in the right place at the right time more than anything. I'm sure there's been more cleverer people out there than me, but like I say, a lot of it is just down to good fortune. Well, I mean, you might say that, but obviously, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And obviously you do have, so a, they say. yeah, you do have the skills that have enabled you to make that profit betting. So that you mentioned there that you do several things now, a good diverse approach. So you've obviously got your own betting. You do the, the work with uh, Odds Checker, William Hill, and you also run your own speed figures website which we've reviewed at SBC and we'll talk about that later do you mind me asking what brings the greatest reward financially from a from what you do because obviously a lot going on there and, and, and juggling all of that must provide a delicate balance for you yeah I mean obviously I wouldn't make anywhere near amount of the money or income that I used to betting for a living when that was the only sort of income I had so you were living and dying by the sword each week there but through other things that have entered the equation, i.e. the odd sticker stuff, the William Hill stuff, there's not so much reliability on that now. So I wouldn't say I'm a recreational punter by any stretch of imagination. I'm still punting my selections and, and doing reasonably well off them, but it's not the be-all and end-all like it used to be, which is quite nice. I'd probably chop it into thirds, really, to be honest. You know, there's sort of like I do a little bit of corporate work and a, a bit of work for uh, George Scott in Newmarket as well. I, I help him with his entries and st stuff like that. We speak pretty much on a daily basis about where his horses are running. So that side of it, as well as also become an extra added dimension, really. I find that quite good fun. I certainly wouldn't be able to probably make a living out of it now just because of the restrictions, how much bookmakers cap you and how much they'll they allow you to win and like I say I've got the luxury of, of two or three sources of income the hill stuff and the odd sticker stuff that means that I don't have to sweat my way through a week thinking I've got to make it pay on the betting side of it but yeah I'd, I'd still say obviously I'd be ahead through the betting but it's just a, a, probably about a third of what I used to make um, back in the halcyon days. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. And obviously things have changed significantly. But, you know, I speak to punters, the few things you've mentioned there stand out. First of all, diversifying. So you're not just relying upon the irregular returns you might get from your own betting. You know, you might make a stack one month and, and lose half of that the next. And it's certainly not a linear progression in terms of income. So having a diverse group, the you know, Odds Checker and William Hill. I was going to ask you about that because I think I saw a video with, with Simon Knott where you, I think it was several years ago, where you said you could still make a living from betting, but obviously things have changed a fair bit these days. You know, you have to take advantage of those edges while you can, and you certainly have done that. And having a diverse group of income is obviously very important. I speak to several pro punters, and they invariably don't just rely on their own betting because, yes, it can be quite provide irregular income. It's not a linear amount that comes in every month. So having that odds checker column and William Hill and obviously your website uh, is important. Let's talk about that. And let's talk about your website. It's based on speed figures. Can you describe them and how they work to me as a relative layman when it comes to using speed figures in, in horse racing and how you use them to find value? Well, I think first and foremost, I found speed figures along with Andy and Sam, they just provide you with more of an objective view. I think me and yourself, let's say if we watched a race today at Twin Canton and you know, we might be impressed by a horse that wins by 20 lengths and think, wow, that must be a brilliant horse. But I think time has taught me to be a little bit more cautious and only really judge a horse once I've known what kind of speed figure it has done. We award horses speed ratings based on the data that we've built up over the years. Basically, what you're trying to do is get an average or an average what we call going correction, how much it's speeding the horses up or slowing them down and taking an average on that particular card. And then based on that going correction average, we'd then award a, a horse like a, a 65 speed figure for, for argument's sake, or a, a 70 speed figure. And it just basically gives you an idea of how fast each race was run. So obviously we'd then, going forward, be wanting to be concentrating on those horses that 
ran a, a really fast time. It, it stands to reason. And then I'll go back and then I'll do my own personal take on it. I'll analyze it myself once Andy and Sam have done the number. There, there'll be the number crunches and I'll go back and then do sectionals on the race, my own, particularly over jumps. I'll do like a circuit to circuit comparison when I'll time a horse from going to the winning horse from going past the winning line and then stop it, obviously, when it crosses the winning line. So if we get, for argument's sake, a horse that's done like a standout overall time figure based on our data, and then the final circuit time is also very impressive compared to the rest. Those are the ones going forward that we would advise punters to be backing. And those are the ones that, that we would put up as in inverted commas selector bets to our clients. On top of that, particularly if they've run those kind of time figures at a certain track before, because we find if a horse has done it once, it will nine times out of 10 go back and repeat that performance at some future date. It might not necessarily be next time, but it might well be when they either have the certain conditions in their favour again, or perhaps if they go back to the track after running somewhere else. So those are the main criteria, really, of why we think the speed figures are an essential part of a punter's tool, or should be. Yes, I, I mean, I've spoken to a few racing experts who who use speed figures or sectional times or some kind of way to provide context to the quality of a race and the performance of each particular horse in that race. I understand the last three furlongs of a race are key. Why is that? And are there other nuances in terms of interpreting the data and applying it to find value to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, the last three furlongs in a flat race is, generally speaking, when the race starts to develop. I think most jockeys will have a sort of clock in their head and they go down to the three pole, and that's when they start sort of asking their amounts for maximum effort. Yeah. So whether it's been slowly run or strongly run, that's usually when the whips are flailing, for want of a better phrase. And again, as I've said, really, with my sort of description of jump racing, if you've got a race on the flat where it's been strongly run, and we know that because of the times that we get, the time figures that we award horses, if then they've produced a final speed figure, the three furlong split time, in accordance to a race which was more slowly run, then again, going forward, you know that those horses in that race have run to absolute maximum capacity. Whereas the slowly run race, any horse could run really quickly for three furlongs. But if he can do it off the back of a strongly run race, and then he's in an environment where he's likely, it's likely to be strongly run again, again, that's open to your own personal interpretation. You have to look at a race and evaluate it before to think, right, this horse has run fast before. If he's going to be slowly run, it's going to be no good to him. But if it's going to be strongly run, and that's when your expertise comes in, those are the ones when we like to think that they've got a better chance than perhaps the market might suggest. Yeah, of course, that all makes sense. There has been more uptake in, in, in these kind of ratings and figures compared to you know, when I started SBC several years ago. Is there a chance that um, with all that information, it could erode the edge or make the market more efficient because it absorbs it with so many people now considering it? Have you seen you know, that taking place with more people using this kind of information to find value? Yeah, I think there's a lot more information, just generally speaking, out there in the public domain now. I do think those time figures and speed figures are very much right the way down the bottom rung of most punters' thought process. It's just human nature, isn't it? it it's just yeah. a lot of punters just haven't got the time. They don't believe in it. They've been brought up on a diet of X beat Y by two lengths. There's five pounds difference between X and Y next time. Y should beat it because for every seven pound is a length. That has very much been ingrained in a lot of punters' sort of thought process, whereas I definitely put more store in how fast a horse has run. Did he do it against a track bias? Did he do it against a, a, a draw bias? Did he do it when a, the yards horses were out of form? There's a hell of a lot more complexity than, than just, like I say, weights and measures. And like I say, from my point of view, I think the times certainly do help you. And I'm quite glad as well that maybe not all punters are that switched onto it. The less that are interested in it, the more edge people like myself, and there is obviously a growing band of, of punters, you just mentioned, that, that that do rely on the times and they do like to look at the times. The less that, that are interested in, the better. I mean, it's, I dread the day when all this data and uh, everything becomes available to everyone because everyone will know what kind of we know. Uh, so as it stays the same and we've still got a little bit of juice left in the market, then um, long may continue. Indeed. I can't imagine that, you know, Cheltenham previews having 
uh, discussion about the sectional times or the slight differentiation in seconds would kind of resonate as much as opinions based on weight or based on why X horse is better than Y horse because of some opinion that, you know, a pundit has or the trainer or whatever it might be. And I guess there's a lot of work that goes into this. You know, this is not just something that you can do in 10, 15 minutes or watch a couple of races and draw a conclusion. You really put in a fair amount of time into this, I imagine. You, you work with Sam and Andy Bate on it. Give us a mere sense of how much grinding away there is behind the scenes to put all these numbers together. Well, I certainly wouldn't be able to do what I do on my own. I found that it would just be literally all-consuming. I, I certainly wouldn't have a wife and sort of family. I, I'd just be living in a bunker somewhere and working on my own <laughs> from sort of six in the morning till the light goes off at night, sort of 11, 12 o'clock at night, and that's not healthy. I can't stress how much Andy and, and Sam have been an integral part of this. I mean, it was mine and Andy's idea in the first place to actually start some kind of service because we felt as though we had, or, or that there was a, a perhaps a desire for it, a want for it out there in Punterland. Andy's been the creator of all the software. He's gone from taking the written data that we used out of the Morden book to actually transfer all that kind of information into a data program, which has just been absolutely golden to, to myself and, and all of us over the years. But obviously, from my personal perspective, I'd probably get up at half six, seven in the morning between then and say, let's say half eight, nine o'clock, I'd be updating selections and doing all the website work, what I call the clerical work. And then perhaps from say nine o'clock to one o'clock, Having after a bit of breakfast, I'd be analysing yesterday's races. I'd be, like I say, doing my own sectional times, my own take on these races, making a few notes, horses that ran well against the bias, et cetera. And then from two to, say, let's say, tea time, six o'clock, I'll be starting the process for tomorrow's racing, downloading the figures, which Andy's already provided. Andy's very good at putting the information out there. Literally, as soon as the, the decks are out, 48-hour decks, our figures are available on the site for, for punters to look at almost a day and a half in advance so they can start work on the following day if they so wish. And obviously it helps me with the selection process for the following day. All the numbers are all there. They all come out easy to follow on the spreadsheet. Straight away, I'm obviously looking at the high rated horses and then clicking on using our tabs and our features that we've got to highlight the horses that ran well at a certain track, whether they ran well on soft ground or heavy ground or whatever you can do that. So you can basically just manipulate all our features to, to sort of whittle a race down to, to manageable numbers. So yeah, that would be my process from start to finish on a daily basis. And then sort of like the evening time is, is family time. It's a real team effort and it still takes a fair chunk of time even with that. And just goes to show that I think some people just think, oh, you're picking a tip and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> throwing a dart at the wall or whatever. And, and I like the name of that horse or whatever, but there's a lot more that goes to it, isn't there? I mean, I've been doing this now for what, 50, 10, 15 years and it is a well, I'm like, it's a well oiled machine now, but you have to stick to it. You don't get many days off, you know, so like swanning off here, then everywhere. But if you miss <laughs> two or three days' work on a, let's say, golfing society holiday, or whatever, you come back, you've got three or four days' worth of times to catch up. I've got to get the sectionals on and the flat. I've got to do the jump times. There's no skipping stuff. There's no like half measures or just sort of make it up as I go along. You've got it, like I say, you've got to be dedicated. You've got to have the right mindset for it as well. So yeah, I like to think that we, all three of us have sort of got that inbuilt program in, inside us. Josh, who works with me, is a big fan of your service. He you know, he brought it to the table for us to look at and he said, look, I'm a big fan. He uses your figures and he uses your, your website and your bets to, for, not just to follow, but also for his own interpretation. And one of the things he mentioned, actually, is you're, you also do a podcast about Irish racing, just to throw that into mix with something else for you to do. And you mentioned as well, it's another specialism of yours. You know, you've made good profits in there, which is interesting because, you know, I've always... Well, other punters will, and I, my impression at times has been how difficult Irish racing is to analyse. Is it a simple matter of the fact that not many people are applying these figures to Irish racing, or is there more to it than that? Yeah, I, I feel as though I'm like a someone who's just walked through the Dragon's Den door there, and Deborah Meadens asked me a question about the figures of a rival competitor, and the person just says, I actually don't know the figures. And I actually probably wouldn't know the number of people that are out there studying recording, watching, timing, analysing Irish racing. My own personal take on it is that I like to think there probably isn't that many out there. Yeah. Hence the fact that it is, as you would say, a little bit of a niche market. And if you can sort of spend enough time watching it and particularly timing it, analysing it, which I'm sure most UK punters haven't got time because they're probably sticking to their old pool of horses, then there has to be an edge based on that. 
And I think it's quite easy, more easy, I found, to find the odd nugget with regards to prices as well and the pricing up of Irish racing. And I found that from a very, very early start because I'm just using Hardy Eustace going back way back in the day in the early noughties when he won the, the old Sun Alliance hurdle. We, we, we got him doing some extremely good time figures uh, over in Ireland. And obviously when he came over here, those time figures stood the test and he went and won the grade one at Cheltenham. And still to that day now, when it comes to the Cheltenham Festival, it's lovely to know and get a comparison with the Irish horses because our data will compare like for like, you know, depending on what ground it is, you know, how fast the race is run, it'll still churn out the same kind of figures like for like. We get a lovely comparison of the Irish novices compared to the English novices. So when it comes to the festival, I can feel as though I'm going in there batting with a full set of armour and a full set of ammunition. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, certainly the Irish markets are weaker. So from my impression, you know, based on the markets themselves and liquidity in them, and what you say there, obviously we record this ahead of Cheltenham. I'll ask you later on about advice you have for Cheltenham in 2024. It sounds like you're the person to to follow and listen to during that. Let's talk then about your tipping, because you not only run your Speed Figures website, but you're also part of Odds Checker. You're their resident or one of their resident tipsters, you, your specialty on racing. And I think your column goes up at, at 9 a.m. each morning. But our review looked at your selector bets, which are from your service, which are the strongest selections that we track from your website. What makes them stand out and different from other tips? How do you select your selector bets? Is it a, a value threshold? Is it based on you know, certain price ranges, intuition or discussion with the rest of your team. Talk me through the selection process for, for those bets. Well, the selection process has been whittled down now. We used to have what we would call selection by committee, i.e. back in the day when we decided to do the selector bets, because we were just basically at the start of it, just a service that provided the information. We didn't actually give selections, but we, the feedback was that a lot of punters were looking at our numbers and going, well, what do we do with them? So we kind of had to spoon feed them a little bit and tell them like you know that we we recommend this because of this reason so it's quite a long story short we come up with a selector option for our clients and in layman's terms yeah we'd highlight perhaps between one and three no more than that most days what i would consider we would consider the absolute standout horse based on its overall performances before i it's top of the speed figures nine times out of ten it's done a fast time it's the one to beat if it runs to its absolute maximum capacity but the all-encompassing key component would be he's run that time figure at that track in the past. We find course and distance form is absolutely key. We won't put a horse up on the selector page that hasn't run a fast time on that track before because we've just found historically that is the way to go, and that's where we've made our most profits over the years. So we stick to that formula. So let's, like, for argument's sake, say we've got I've got four selections on a Saturday. If the two are at the course and distance. Those are the two I would go for. Two to one is usually the cutoff point where we'd feel uncomfortable tipping a horse under two to one, basically because any tipping service can tip six to four or even money shots. So we like to be looking at horses at that four to one or over, ideally, but three, two to one would be the shortest we'd advise for a win. We like working in around the six, seven to one each way market. Sometimes we'll put two up in a race where our numbers are saying these two are, are definitely worth backing in, say, a big field handicap. We'd put a 10 to 1 and 12 to 1 shot up and we'd advise backing both of those two each way. So we've done that before. Whereas my odds checker horses would have a little bit more flexibility to them, i.e. they run a fast time, but not necessarily at that track. I'll take a chance that they will handle a certain track. Like, for instance, at Cheltenham next week or the week after, there might be an Irish horse, of course, has never run at Cheltenham but his times are so good at similar tracks like Leopardstown and Nay, stiff uphill finishes that I think that they'll probably translate that to Cheltenham. So there is a little bit more of an intuitive nature or a license to be a little bit more intuitive with my odds checker tips alongside my selector tips. So like I said, there is a definite differential between one and the other. Okay, yeah, because that's important. Otherwise, you'll be constantly second-guessing yourself and wondering exactly where to what bets go to where. And So I have the times, right? Selector bets go up a about just after eight o'clock and then odds checkers at 9 a.m., you have to supply them at 8.45, is that right? So that's correct. At that point, you make a decision. Yeah, I think our clients deserve at least an hour's grace with regards to getting the prices. You know, they, they pay the premium for coming onto our service in the first place. You know, a lot of punters can just wait and, and look at the odds checker tips and say, well, I'm happy with that. But they by then, let's say a, an eight to one shot might be a five to one shot in, in that period of time. So if you are price sensitive, and a lot of punters are nowadays, they're very savvy with taking the best prices they get in the village. 
then you know that hours grace is you know we feel as though a, a decent amount of time scale to to get on what they want to get on. And uh, do you see considerable price contractions? We did do some analysis on this from the odds checker. We obviously saw more on that. And in terms of getting your own bets on in the market currently as well, that that must be a challenge. At, 8, 9 a.m. in the morning, if you know, well, when I put this bet up, it's going to halve in price or everyone's yeah. going to pile in. Is that a delicate balance to try and strike? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You are obviously going to tip bookmakers off just by placing the bet yourself. That's what's going to happen. And you can see the sort of paper trail starting <laughs> a lot along the way. <laughs> that goes, just goes with the territory, I'm afraid. So sometimes I end up tipping poor value horses on odds check. I, I, I've written my column and let's say I've got three selections and you know, our clients get eight to one about the one. I end up sometimes tipping a horse that's like four or five to one, which is not ideal. And particularly if I want to put something up each way, we can afford to put it up each way on the service. But then when it comes to odd check, I think, mm, do I put a four to one shop up each way odd checker? Yeah. Sometimes I'll have to go win only because I, I have to sort of move, move with the price changes, et cetera. So yeah, like I say, it is a balancing act. I'd like to feel as though that the sort of P&L that we have on the selector page, the P&L on the odds checker column as well, still stands at a fairly healthy one probably not as good as it was back in the day I remember sort of like some years me getting to sort of three four hundred points a year profit but nowadays because like I say the introduction of the service that the prices probably aren't as great as what they used to be so I'm probably running around about an average of 150 200 points profit a year so there has been a little bit of a call back there but um like I say it's still a healthy profit over the course of 12 months I feel yeah, I've got the figures here in front of me. So your selector bets, which are those from the service that you run, it's 16.26% ROI. That's from 2,316 bets. And then odds checker, we've got nearly 7,000 bets and the ROI is 11.5%. So yeah. you know, that's, I think, for a free column and as a, a window inside to the world of what you do, I feel like that's a, a really good return. And although you know, naturally you can't really do much about the odds that move and the market you know, you can't control the betting market there. But as someone who wants to get a sense of what you do, I feel like it's a really good introduction to you at the very least. And uh, I was going to ask you as well, that you would be a prominent tipster these days. I'm tipping at value prices. Dealing with the negative side of that can no doubt be a challenge. You know, we've seen other tipsters get into online arguments or perhaps struggle to deal with the pressure of losing runs, which affect everybody. How do you approach that and how do you handle that? You come across very level-headed and very sensible, but I imagine it's still a challenge when you're tipping up and you've got so many people following and, you know, you're in a bit of a bad run. Yeah, I mean, I'm fairly sort of looking some respect, Pete, that I get someone to sort of run my... Twitter column for me, then the guys at Odds Checker almost like ghostwrite it for me. So it just means that I haven't got to get onto a daily involvement or sort of slanging match with someone who's, who's slagging me off. I'm sure it happens on a daily, weekly basis. You know, my three selections lose. What, what a terrible judge this guy is. Or if I go for a week, perhaps tipping two winners in the whole week, why are you paying for this guy's service? He, you know, he's a fraudster, he's a shyster, you know, kind of all this kind of stuff. But I just try and blank out the noise by not even looking at it. I think you could waste a hell of a lot of time and energy replying to people and getting yourself hot under the collar and wound up for, for no reason. I like to think I've got a fairly thick skin anyway. And I know that long-term punters probably wouldn't take that view if they followed me for a while. And it's frustrating. And I feel a huge sense of responsibility tipping every day for not only our clients, but for the odds checker guys as well. There's a huge amount of integrity and a whole lot of hard work, as I've told you guys, involved in it. And there's no one feels it, the pain more than I do when not only have I lost money myself, but I feel as though I've lost money for a lot of other people as well. So I've got a real sort of incentive all the time to, to correct it if I've had a long run. But the one thing I don't do is, like I say, get myself involved in people slagging you off. That's nature of the beast. That's going to happen. And I know there are people out there that are very reactionary to people that are following tipsters. Sometimes you are an easy target. I'm sure that the likes of Tom Segal and Paul Keeley and Hugh Taylor, three respected judges, they've had long runs or poor runs and they've had people that put them out on social media and hang them out to dry. But I've been in this game long enough now to not pay too much attention to that. And as long as you believe in what you do, and like I say, long term, I feel as though that you know we've made a reasonable fist of it over the years. That the sort of true followers will stay loyal to you. So focus on them. Yeah, it makes sense. And let's have a brief chat then about your own betting. You mentioned earlier that it's probably about a third of what you used to do in terms of, I guess, how much you were able to bet, how much you were able to get down. How do you approach that currently 
you know, are you getting on, like say early, you're getting on at 8, 9 a.m.? I think I mentioned you in an interview with Simon Knott, and in that one, I think three or four years ago, you said some bookmakers were still using you as a mark yeah. for horse racing. Is that still the case? I'm guessing not, or, you know, it'd be nice if it is. Yeah, that, that still seems to be the case with, wow. I, think, I think it's four or five firms now. I must admit, there's, there's several firms that won't take my business, which I'm a little bit surprised that they don't have the same sort of policy, because... I think that's probably one of one of the reasons why the game isn't perhaps so healthy as it should be nowadays. You know, a lot of people, a lot of betting companies use the policy of just basically getting rid of customers and not taking their business. But I think if they let you on and let you on to reasonable amounts, everyone's happy. And I'm not saying I'll get fortunes on, but at least there's four firms, I won't mention their names, that like to know what I'm backing. They probably accept a loss over the course of the year, but they let me get on. They're, they're happy with that. And they trade their book accordingly around that. I'm sure they use other tipsters and punters that they follow and respect to help them get a picture on a race because I think that's what I'm probably used as but yeah, yeah. I can get reasonable amounts on because some firms will probably allow you to win 500 some 1000 some 1500 some firms won't let you do multiple bets some firms they scowl at what we would call bad each way horses so you have an agreement with a trader to say you know, I'm not going to be backing a four to one shot each way when the favourite odds on or some filthy Irish eight runner right runner novice hurdle and stuff like that <laughs> So as long as you're not taking the mickey and you play above board with them and that they allow you to get on, then like I said, I'm certainly in a, in a reasonably fortuitous position of being able to, to play away and to get on to the numbers that I'm relatively comfortable with nowadays. Like I say, I, I wouldn't be winning them well, like I used to back 10, 15 years ago, but it's not the be all and end all nowadays. That's encouraging, really. Are they larger firms or are they some of the smaller independents? No, all big ones. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. That means they still have some appetite to, to lay on horse races. If you want me to mention them, I'll tell you what they are. But to be fair, they've all been absolutely good as gold. They really have. Yeah, if you want to mention them, why not? Because I think people will be intrigued to know which of the firms that... Um... Yeah, I think Skybet partly because they used to sponsor... Uh, I'm not sure that's the case now. I'll just check Yeah, that's part of it, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's probably one of the reasons there. I'd say the best one from day one has been Bet Victor. They've been absolutely brilliant with me right from the start. Chris Paul, yeah. I'd conversations with Chris, not on a regular basis, but every now and again. He'll only ever come on to me and pull me up if I've cross the line with a bet, but they'll take my business, no problem. A uni bet, they're pretty good. Labbrooks have been fairly good, I must admit. <laughs> They've given me a decent crack of the whip. And then I've have to, I have to use Matchbook uh, nowadays because the bet the Betfair commissions were just ridiculous. I was up 40% right. in the sort of like... Premium charge. The sort of golden era. Yeah, premium charge. Just, I couldn't justify it anymore. So I, I use Matchbook as, as a trading tool if I want to edge anything. But yeah, like I say, four firms, all good as gold. I can't praise them enough. Well, credit to them for taking your bets. Obviously, I know of Skybet and Chris Poole at Bet Victor always comes across as, you know, wanting to to take a bet as long as you're not, you know, taking the advantage or like say some of those dodgy each way races and interesting to hear Unibet and Ladbrokes because they don't come in for a great uh, commentary or reputation, but obviously there still is an appetite to take sharp money to help form their market because, you know, I, I've interviewed several punters for this podcast and many of them talk about being paid to provide the racing card and what have you, and that having finished for many of them, there isn't that appetite, but it does seem there is still some there amongst those firms to take you know, advantage of your expertise and to, to help price up their markets. Absolutely. I, th- I think it's got to be healthy for the game going forward, isn't it? To, to close people's accounts because they're notoriously sharp or something like that. I just think that's narrow-mindedness. Uh, bookmakers don't want to be fleeced you know, on, a, on a regular basis. And like I said, they're entitled to do what they do. And, but they have been probably not short of blame from perhaps stopping punters at will just by taking the best prices. They don't even have to win before they stop them nowadays, so I'm hearing. And a lot of punters get turned away and it turns them into the black market and they can't get on. Whereas, you know, if they keep people interested and keep them ticking longer, because they, even if they just cap what they can win, just say you can win up to 250 quid or something like that, at least they can get on and they feel as though they're getting a fair crack of the whip and everyone's happy and it all get put back into the pot. But yeah, to turn people away, like I say, it's one thing that I think gripes a lot of punters in the game, not just myself. Oh, definitely. You know, even just the ability to get on at a certain time of day to a, a relatively, it could even be a small stake. I think punters would quite happily be able to get on, you know, to win £500 or whatever it might be. They're not looking not looking for big betting coups and, and multis to win ten grand. If you're going to take that approach, then obviously, you know, you know you're going to expect not everyone's going to lay that. But yeah, into decent markets, do you have to tip it a bet at a certain point in time or... You know, I guess you're not able to take it 48 hours out or uh, early prices so much. Uh, are they just looking for a good balance between when you price take a bet and not always taking, you know, standout prices? Is that kind of agreement you have? 
Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't be betting overnight on a regular basis. Occasionally I might if I just feel as though a horse is just going to go through the floor and I might miss the value completely. Obviously, a lot of these firms set up a cap overnight down the sea. You know, you, you can't be betting one o'clock in the morning and trying to get on something. So I, I tend to do most of my business. I'm, I'm sure they're aware that come sort of like between eight and quarter past eight, that's when I start sort of um, getting the engine started and, and playing up. But I'd just be chipping away, really. I'd probably spread my bets over a two or three firms and, and rather than just splodge it all on one because mm-hmm. like I say that that would be sending the alarm bells ringing so yeah I'm more than happy with what I what I get on nowadays certainly no complaints obviously you talked about matchbook there is that just to hedge off or do you actually do some pre-race or even in play betting there on, on racing very rarely what I play actually go out my way to bet in play I just haven't got the the software nowadays I used to have I used to have a very good connection where you live but I'm out in the sticks now and the, the connection over here just wouldn't justify me trying to play and run in Plus the fact, you know, the matchbook stuff they haven't got, the bet genies and stuff like that that you used to have on Betfair. So you couldn't just click a button, it's all manually inputted and all that kind of stuff. But what I will do, if I've backed one at, let's say, five to one, and I know he'll travel really well and he'll probably trade a huge amount shorter and running, I might stick something in at six to four, even money, just for a bit of insurance and stuff like that. So I'm not going to lose out on the bet completely. As a facility to use as and when I need it, but I certainly wouldn't be a huge, like I say, backer or layer, particularly not layer. I think laying is incredibly difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll have you obviously in a similar topic of talk about restrictions. How about the limits that are still being applied to people betting on horse racing? Earlier this week, as we record this, there was a, a debate in Parliament to talk about this and its impact on a sport like horse racing is you know vast because you know it's so intrinsically linked with betting itself. What are your opinions on this? And you know, are you worried about the sport of horse racing and how the betting markets might evolve if we see this continuation of these affordability limits and supposedly frictionless checks, which are anything but. Well, it's definitely pushing people out of the game. It's, it's alienating its course supplier, isn't it, really? You know, racing wouldn't survive without punters. And I don't think punters have been fairly treated. I think one of the phrases used by one of the MPs is they're trying to crack a nut with a sledgehammer. They're basically tarnishing a lot of us all with the same brush. I think we know in the industry, particularly from a racing perspective, the problem really is the online sort of gaming and fruit machines and stuff like that, that a lot of the sort of in inverted commas addicts, that's where the problem lies. That's a game of chance. A game of skill, I think, is a totally different entity and it needs to be treated as so. But for someone outside looking in who doesn't really understand the game, and a lot of these MPs probably wouldn't, they can't see the difference between one and the other. It's just all-encompassing, isn't it? Uh, and I think that's where the problem lies, really, to be honest. How it's going to be resolved, I don't know. That debate in the Parliament the other day was at least made our side of it have a little bit of a voice. And maybe the affordability checks won't be so intrusive further down the line. But you do feel as though that it's becoming increasingly harder for racing to survive as it is, particularly, like I say, from a prize money perspective, if everything has been sucked out of it this end, i.e. the punting side of it. And will that impact your decisions moving forward? I was going to ask you about your plans. Is it more of the same or are you weighing up the impact of all of the changing nature of the horse racing world at the moment and its impact on what you're doing? Well, it might affect our service, for instance, if punters can't get on. And let's say you know, we're saying, well, come and join us. You can back this horse at this price. But if, if they are constantly being told that, A, they can't get on because they're a winning punter or they're going to get the collar felt because they want to know why they've just deposited 200 quid, then obviously that has a knock-on effect to us as well. So we see it as a you know a serious worry. But as long as it is as it is, and maybe this, the good sense might just turn that, that that opinion around, and then you know hopefully we should be okay for the foreseeable future. I mean, it might well be that they you know further down the line we might have to be a different total funding model, a whirlpool situation like they have in certain parts of the world, and obviously the betting at Royal Ascot's very healthy because of that. Maybe that might be have to be looked into to fund the sport a bit better. But that's for certainly brighter and sharper minds than me. Out of my pay grade, that. So we need something to change, don't we? It'll be interesting to see. We're in the run-up to Cheltenham, and it'll be interesting to see its impact as we approach and we see betting during Cheltenham. And, you know, are people going to be unable to bet during Cheltenham because it's the middle of March and they can't deposit enough into their account? to actually take advantage of some very healthy and, res- and robust uh, racing markets that week. It's the optimal time to bet as a racing punter for that reason. Obviously, the high-quality racing. So the will be interesting to see what takes place there. And speaking of Cheltenham, do you have any specific pieces of advice for finding winners at Presbury Park? Is there anything or any horses that you'd like to flag? I never like to get too bogged down in specific bets, but why not for this particular podcast? If anyone's listening ahead of Cheltenham, you know, any horses we should watch out for in particular? 
Well, I'd obviously put it into two categories, really. First and foremost, I think course and distance form is a prerequisite. It doesn't apply to every bet I'm going to have, so I don't want to contradict myself. But horses I know run big speed figures. I could give you a few examples. Horses like Ginny's Destiny, for instance. We have a particularly healthy time for that horse when it won over the course and distance back in, I think it was January. You pretty much know that he's very much the one to beat in, in a race like the Turners. But course and distance form in, in general, but or particularly festival form, horses that have done, been there, done it and got the T-shirt, they've run at, in certain races before and, and you know that they're used to that strongly run, soundly run environment with a big feel like Langer Dan, for instance, who won the, I think he won the Coral Cup last year. He'd been a, yeah. a regular at the track before. So those kind of horses just seem to come alive, don't they, when they're, they're in that big field, strongly run environment. That's what our figures obviously will come to the fore. Looking for sort of like, individual horses that I think are definitely worth keeping on the right side of based on the times that we've got them doing uh, and could be a little bit of value as well for, for, for your listeners. Um, there's a horse trained by Henry de Bromhead in Ireland called Waterford Whispers who got beat last time out at Leopardstown in a slowly run race which didn't suit his skill set but prior to that he'd won really well at Fairy House in a strongly run race and the form of that race has worked out really well. We've got really good healthy figures for Waterford Whispers, in comparison to all the good horses on the card as well. He beat a horse called Answer to Cave, who's gone on to win at grade two level subsequently. And he runs in the Martin Pike handicap on the very, very final race of the meeting, the last race, the 28th race. He's around about 12 to 1. And based on our times, we think he can certainly outrun those odds. And another one as well would be a horse called Kill Beg King, a UK trained horse, trained by Anthony, Bro- Anthony Honeyball. He was third in the Reynoldstown chase the other day at Ascot. And again, using our time figures, he ran the fastest time of the day. He was in a race that was the fastest time. But also, this is really significant. This is where the sectional times give you another edge, another dimension to how that race has run. The first three home in that race, actually the first four home, ran considerably quicker, ran about 15, 20 lengths quicker than Pick Dory, who won the grade two over two and a half miles half an hour afterwards. Now. That tells you that that three-mile race was incredibly good from start to finish. To run better than a grade two, two and a half miler in a three-mile race is exceptional, particularly for novices. So I suggest that Kilbeg King will go really well in the National Hunt Chase, which is, I think, the last race on day one. So there's two for you. Decent value at the time of recording. Ran about 12 to 1 for Kilbeg King in the National Chase. And the very last race... To conclude the meeting, hopefully we'll get out on the high on Water to Whispers in the Martin Pipe. Okay. And Jimmy's Destiny is another one that's free then, isn't it? And Ginny's Destiny, yeah. We, that form line between here, Ginny's Destiny, Grey Dawning, those are the best two UK novices we've got on our figures. That's going to be a race to savour between those two. But Ginny's Destiny has at least got it over the course and distance as well. Well, there's three to watch. Jimmy's Destiny, Waterford Whispers and Kilbeg King. They'll be the trio of, of horses I'll be watching at Cheltenham coming up. And just in general, is there any, I'll try and ask guests if they have any advice for listeners to help them with their betting. Anything that stands out to you as perhaps one of the or a really important thing that many punters don't actually do, aside from, you know, using your speed figures, for example? <laughs> Yeah, obviously, we, we feel as though that the numbers certainly help. They're not the be-all and end-all. I'm not saying here that, you know, we've reinvented the wheel here or anything. But like I said, they give you a more objectional view. They, they're a starting point for the race. They're basically saying that this is what's happened in the past. This horse has run to this figure in the past. It's up to you to interpret whether that is going to happen again. So there is, like I say, a lot of it is down to your own personal take and, and, and what have you. I would say the three golden rules I'd look for would be Yes, time. B would be don't pay too much attention to perhaps the weights and measures. You know, I hear so many judges on the TV after a horse got beat half a length in a driving finish and, you know, he was racing from £2 out of the handicap and they say, oh, if he hadn't been out of the handicap by £2 or he's carrying £2 more, he would have probably won. I mean, it's the biggest load of nonsense you've ever heard in your life. It's so lazy. I mean, You've got to go back and analyse the race. Did, did he get hampered in the race? Did he make a mistake? Did he run on the slowest part of the track? All those things could prevent him from winning rather than just at the end of the race saying, oh, yeah, it was the £3 extra that he that he picked from last time that cost him the race. I mean, really? Are they, are they really saying that £3 made, made the difference? Like I say, I challenge anyone to, to come up with that conclusion. So I personally wouldn't spend that much time on, you know, weights and measures here, there and everywhere. 
particularly when you've got novice hurdlers and bumper winners who carry seven pound penalties. I actually think that's probably one of the best value bets left in the game. Yeah, is because the herd mentality tends to go against horses that have a seven pound penalty. Just because, like I say, it's ingrained on a lot of punters out there that think, oh, if a horse has got a seven pound extra, it can't win. I take the opposite view. It's run fast and it's run faster than the others. If A beats B, A will beat B pretty much nine times out of ten, as far as I could see. So again, I think that's another angle for punters perhaps to, you know, approach. The other two real criteria is make sure that your horse has gone on the ground before. And more importantly, it comes from a yard in great form. There's several horses that are strongly fancied at Chandler that are coming from yards out of form, such as your Kim Bailey's of this world. Venetia Williams has gone quiet. Whereas Henry de Bromhead, goes like saying Willie Mullins, and several others that are, that are doing really well at this moment in time. Ben Pauling as well, I think I'll have a good meeting because he's going particularly well. So like I can say there's lots of variables that conclude your final selection. But those sort of like two or three main criteria, which I mentioned there, hopefully will give you a little bit of a, a starting point. Ah, some great advice there. I could sit back and listen to you talk about uh, horse racing and, and how to you know navigate the especially Cheltenham and, and to find someone does and ignore some of the uh, prevailing narrative that sometimes is, doesn't actually help you particularly. So really appreciative of that and, and your time today, Andy. And, and we've actually got through the podcast without my mentioning that you're a Liverpool fan, as I understand it, <laughs> yes. with obviously a very Scouse accent. How do, does someone with, with that accent end up being from what I would term the dark side of Merseyside? Basically, I was born in that era where Liverpool were the, the, the team, I suppose. Um, being a young lad, three, four, and was getting involved in football and watching football on TV and playing at the park with my dad, who was a huge footballer, huge football fan, and he used to play regularly. You know, the, the Bill Shankly era, the, the sort of early 70s, when, you know, Kevin yeah. Keegan, Toshiak and Jimmy Case and all those kind of players. And that's how I started, really. I just lo- love love watching Liverpool and it's always been that way ever since. Try and go to as many games as I can. Luckily, I've got a few people with season tickets and passes that I, I'm privy to, and I, I do get to probably go to more cup games because they tend to not go to the cup games. I've, I've done most of the UEFA League games and, and the FA Cup and the League Cup games this year, so I do get up there at least once or twice a month. Go, actually, going tonight as we've been going to the FA Cup third round again, the fifth round against Southampton. So that should be good fun. And yeah, it's going to be difficult to replace Jurgen Klopp, isn't it? That shock news several weeks ago has resonated for the football world. And how can you replace him? And as you saw on Sunday, that kind of like aura that he has on the touchline and the, the sort of belief that he instills in his players very much rubbed off in that result because I think for large majority of the second half, Chelsea were in the ascendancy and it was only through sheer willpower and not wanting to get beat that the young lads who came on managed to sort of turn it around and give Klopp a, a reasonable send off but let's hope that's not the last trophy that he picks up between now and the end of the season okay well we'll agree to disagree on that one I I was actually thinking what what kind of penalty would Liverpool have in that final given you know you had so many players out and so many kids uh, play but yeah like I said a very impressive man and I have to grudgingly admit you know he's been a a positive force for football but to look forward to mid-table mediocrity and joining hopefully Everton in in, in that (laughs) next season in the Premier League not the Championship well, Andy, I wish you well. I wish you know you well throughout Cheltenham. I wish you well throughout the rest of 2024. And if people are interested in what you do, obviously you can find you on our checker. There is an, a detailed SPC review of your speed figure service. And there is a significant discount. It's instead of I think 39 a month, it's 25 a month for an SBC member. So yes. if you're interested in that, if you have a paid Smart Better Club membership, you can not only read the review, but obtain that discount. But if you want to check you out, then obviously odds checker is there. And, any other links to, to be of note? You've got you're on social media, you, William Hill, any other places that people can find you, Andy? Yeah, I mean, there's two links here. There's the, the sort of hashtag link on Oddschecker. We, we've got our own personal one as well. I think it's underscore AH speed or something like that. I can't, can't quite remember that because I, I'm not, unfortunately, all that social media savvy. Sam does it, all that side of it for us, and the guys at Oddschecker do it for, my, for myself there. But yeah, we could do with perhaps a little bit more publicity because we tend not to flag ourselves up too much. Sam does a few, we do a few promos here, there and everywhere. But this platform is going to be um, crucial for us. So we're very grateful that you can have us on and at least give listeners a little bit more of an insight on what we do. And, you know, we'd like to think certainly now for 25 quid, that's a you know reasonable value. But only time will tell, of course, whether that uh, does work out. Oh, well, I think it's great value. And I do read the SPC review for why. Obviously, we're going to the analysis of why and who it suits. With the horse racing industry, obviously, you do need to have some bookmaker accounts available to you. 
But uh, for those of you interested in horse racing with that situation, then please do check it out. So yeah, once again, Andy, thank you ever so much for, the, for your time. And I wish you over not just Cheltenham, but moving forward and uh, look forward to continue monitoring uh, your service. So thank you very so much. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Peter, and uh, good luck to everyone.